Hello again, welcome back to IndyCar. I'm Gordon Ross and it's the 11th of October. Rather than doing a simple news programme today, I thought it might be worth um, explaining something about law as it stands with regards to independence. Now, it's been, uh, it's been said, particularly by, um, shall we say, opponents of independence, that there are all kinds of preconditions which much must exist before we are allowed to vote on whether to remain a part of the United Kingdom. And most recently, these were being spouted by Alastair Union Jack, the man who is nominally uh, the Scotland office minister. He claims to be a Scot, but I think um, very, very far from uh, that description. Alastair Jack has claimed that in order for Scots to be allowed, in inverted commas, to have a referendum on their own self-determination. There must be at least 60% of the population in favour of it for at least six months, and at least 60% of the population have to vote yes, uh, and a whole lot of other preconditions which he seems to just have invented. Uh, and of course he has just invented them, because the British state cannot put any preconditions on a referendum which it already admitted itself it is not going to be a part of because it refuses to sign the Section 30 order, which would make Britain a part of the, uh, or a participant, if you like, in the independence uh, debate. So if they don't want to be part of the independence referendum, they can't make preconditions about it, can they? Because they're not in charge of it, because we would be in charge of it. So there's no way that Alistair Jack could put any preconditions. Imagine if Scotland were playing England at Wembley, uh, and Scotland would only be credited with a win if they scored six more goals than the English side. It's ridiculous, and everybody knows it's ridiculous. And I'm guessing even Alistair Jack knows that what he's saying is utter rubbish. So what is the real situation with regards to law when it comes to an independence referendum? There are some people on uh, pro-independence blogs and websites who claim that Scotland could simply just uh, secede, it could just simply declare its independence and say that the treaty is null and void. Technically speaking, a pro-independence government could do that, but it would have to create, first of all, a bill which said that, then it would have to become an act of Parliament, and the, the, the repealing of the Acts of Union would have to be agreed in Parliament. Now, having done something like that, it is not entirely a democratic decision. Because although there is a majority of people who voted for the SNP and the Greens, who were both in favour of independence, there would not have been a specific question asked of the population, do you want to be an independent country? So as far as recognition is concerned, if Scotland were to simply declare its independence in that way, the rest of the community, particularly the United Nations, may not recognise the new state. So in order to get that recognition, Scotland needs to hold its referendum not under UK law or legislation or powers, but under the powers given to it under the, uh, the Charter of the United Nations. And recently, uh, a senior legal advisor to the United Nations uh, made a statement in which he said that Scotland could hold a perfectly lawful referendum under the terms laid down by the United Nations, which would be recognised in international law, in which the United Kingdom would have basically no say, because this is not a matter of British law, because first of all, there is no such thing as British law. There is English law and there is Scottish law, and the two exist side by side and are equal in perpetuity, all part of the Union Treaty of 1707. So let's look at this logically. The United Nations uh, is a huge institution which, uh, in, in which hundreds of countries are participants. Now, for the United Nations uh, to say that Scotland is not a country is not going to happen anyway, because the United Nations already regards Scotland as a discrete state in a relationship, shall we say, in a treaty with another state. And therefore, Scotland, technically speaking, is not actually a subset of any other state. It is simply a country in union with another country. The union is, is what we're talking about here. It's not a country. It is an assembly of two countries, Scotland and England, who signed the original treaty. The British state, as it became, then decided to incorporate Wales and Northern Ireland in acts after the Act of Union, which cemented the whole thing together into one uh, 
aggregate, if you like, of the four nations. But it's still four nations. But the main participants in this union are Scotland and England, not the rest of the United Kingdom. It is Scotland that has a treaty with England. It is simple as that. Now, under international laws, any state, especially one which is already in existence, which has a thousand year long history, which has founding documents, which establish itself as a state and recognised as a state, does not have the same issues that, say, a region of a country might have. But remember that during uh, the long history of British colonial um, exploitation across the world, all of the nations uh, which expelled the British colonists and became independent did not do so under British law. They couldn't, simply because British law cannot extend as far as that. British law is only pertinent in England because there is no British law. There is only English law in England and there is only Scottish law in Scotland. Sadly, Wales is a subject to English law as it has been subsumed into the greater English state, if you like. So the situation is pretty simple. Scotland can hold a referendum. Now remember that Nicola Sturgeon will probably make one final offer to the UK to sign the Section 30 order and to participate in the referendum which she's planning. When that is refused, because it undoubtedly will be refused, then the gloves are off because it shifts then from being a matter of domestic law into a matter of international law. And this is what the United Nations uh, legal advisor was saying, that under the terms of the United Nations, any country can vote to secede from any larger state but they have to do it democratically. In order to be recognised as a fully-fledged state, a majority of the people in that country need to vote for it. And that is what will happen. Under international law, if Scotland has a referendum, it would be recognised under international law as legitimate and lawful, despite whatever the English state says about it, Scotland is the state which is seceding, and therefore international law applies to its vote. That means that we hold a referendum under our own terms, which would be free and fair. We would invite in United Nations uh, observers to make sure that it was fair and to make sure it was scrupulously done and that nobody could gainsay the result. Now, although referendums traditionally in the United Kingdom are advisory, you may recollect that the Brexit referendum was also advisory and yet it was acted upon as though it was not. It was acted upon as though it was a binding referendum. The British government chose to turn that into a binding referendum and forced everybody to go along with it, including Scotland, which voted in a massive majority not to Brexit. So we have the reason to secede from the, the UK, to end our treaties with the UK. What we need is the consent of the people. And that is what an international recognisable referendum will do. I believe that the reason the SNP is not so concerned about Boris Johnson and not so concerned uh, about Section 30 and why it is so relaxed about the whole situation is they know that this is the only route it can go. Now it's possible that the UK could decide to try to take Scotland to court. Um, if Scotland holds an independence referendum under international law. But it wouldn't get very far. Who is going to adjudicate? Well, it would have to be the International Court of Justice, which the British government is deciding that it probably will not recognise in the future. And yet that is the international arbiter on all matters of secession. So what will happen is we will hold our referendum. The British government will refuse to participate in it. Therefore, as I mentioned earlier on, they cannot put preconditions on it because they're not participating, they're not agreeing to it, and therefore they have no say in how it's conducted. However, we must ensure that it's conducted entirely lawfully and that it is scrupulously fair to both sides of the argument in Scotland so that everybody gets a fair vote. If the answer is yes, and the majority of Scotland, even if it's 51% of us, if there's a majority for independence, then the United Nations would then recognise that, because it is under their auspices, under their charters, that it's being carried out. The Scottish Government, and Nicola Sturgeon in particular, have very good relations with the United Nations. She has visited the United Nations several times, 
She's been questioned uh, about Scotland's position in the UK. She's been questioned about what independence will mean, how Scotland will behave once it is uh, separated from the Union, how it will behave towards England, Wales and Northern Ireland, how things will stay the same in regards to our relationships with those countries, but how Scotland intends to rejoin the European Union and to take full part in international affairs under the jurisdiction of the UN. Now, all of these things are exactly what the United Nations wants from any country which is joining it as a new member. And Scotland, as a small nation, has a great deal to offer. As we know, the United Nations recognises Scotland's enormous efforts, particularly in the field of human rights, where Scotland is constrained by a British government which wants to tear up uh, the United Nations Charter on Human Rights. It wants to remove that from British legislation. Scotland will not do that and has a right to incorporate, for example, uh, the International Convention on the Rights of the Child into its domestic law, which is already a bill which is already an act in Scotland. This is what the British government's uh, Supreme Court was getting so annoyed about, was the fact that Scotland did this without their permission. However, we have to do that without their permission, because if we want to be a full member of the United Nations, we have to comply with the United Nations charters, and we have to show that we wish to do that, but are being prevented by the larger state. So this is not just a game of politics between England and Scotland anymore. This is about Scotland demonstrating to the United Nations its full intentions to be a United Nations member, to be an outward-looking state, to be a fully a democratic state and to allow everybody in the country to choose what their future is. And that is all that can be asked of you as a state when you wish to secede, in other words, to separate from a larger state. But as I said, Scotland's position is not the same as most states which are seceding from a larger body. Scotland is already a nation. It's in a treaty with another nation, i.e. England. It does not have an identity crisis because it already exists as a country. Therefore, it's relatively easy for the rest of the world to recognise Scotland as a discrete entity in its own right. It already does, and it recognises that Scotland is trapped at the moment in a treaty of union with England, which it now no longer uh, feels is worth remaining in. So the simple situation is this. As far as I can tell, Nicola Sturgeon will announce that there will be a referendum, whether she announces it now or before COP26 or after it, or in April next year is largely irrelevant. There will be a referendum. It will be without the permission, if you want to call it that, or, the, or without the participation of the United Kingdom. The UK will not be able to put preconditions on it, despite what Alistair Jack says, because it will not be operating the referendum under English laws or even Scottish laws. It will be operating the referendum under international law. And that trumps everything else. When states secede from larger bodies like this, they look to the other countries in the United Nations to recognise them and support them. And in Scotland's case, Scotland has never strayed from the path, the path of peaceful democracy in its entire existence. The only time Scotland has ever had to fight for its existence has been when it was invaded by England hundreds of years ago. That is no longer the case. The, the devolution settlement was an attempt to try to settle things in the 1990s, but things have changed so much since then, and particularly in the last four years. Um, and since Scotland's independence referendum, the United Kingdom, as we knew it in 2014, has gone. And we are now faced with an, an austere, starving, hungry uh, country without any support from anybody else. And with America now saying that if the UK tears up the Northern Ireland Protocol, then America will view that as a severe infraction by the United Kingdom. And I think that the relationship between Britain and America would very rapidly go downhill. The stakes are extremely high here. So all of the indicators show that we will have a lawful referendum. And that referendum will be conducted under the watchful eye of the United Nations. And I believe that the Scottish Government will invite the United Nations to come and oversee this event. So there is no way that any other country on the planet, including England, will be able to say it was not done fairly. It has to be done this way, but it has to be done now because we can see the way the future is now looking.
Britain is more and more isolated. Britain's Prime Minister has abandoned his post in the middle of a crisis to go on holiday. He doesn't care what happens and he has no clue how to solve the problems. In fact, he's abdicated all responsibility for the chaos that his government has caused and is now dumping that responsibility onto Britain's businesses and in particular Scotland's businesses. And I can tell you right now that Scotland's uh, exports have crashed 16% since the beginning of this year. And that's the largest fall in exports in Scotland's history. And this is all the fault of Brexit. So there is no more time to waste. Scotland can't wait any longer. It has to go to the UN and say, we're having a referendum. Will you please come and observe this referendum to make sure that we conduct it correctly? And please ensure that we will be recognised as a state no matter what the result is. If the result is yes, please make sure that we will be recognised. The UN has no particular fears about Scotland becoming independent. It would only be worried about a state breaking away from another state if it started a chain reaction. But that is not what's happening here. Scotland is not trying to break up the European Union here. It is simply trying to free itself from what we can all see is going to be a disastrous future under a bizarre um, clown show of a Tory government which has no clue what it's doing anymore, has lost the plot and lost control of the economy and is now even lying about its own, uh, its own funding coming from the, the Treasury. The Treasury recently said that Quasi Kwarteng, who said he was in talks with the Treasury to help businesses uh, to get through this current crisis. They said he was just making it up. So a government which is making up policies, which is inventing things and lying about what it's doing, is what we face as our future. And that's why I believe the United Nations will be sympathetic. And I think in the future, despite the fact that the UK will resist this referendum to the bitter end and will make all sorts of outlandish claims, they can't fight it any longer. They have already lost the argument in Scotland and nobody believes them anymore. So thankfully, the United Nations exists and thankfully, Nicola Sturgeon has excellent relations with them and they know her very well and regard her as a moderate democratic leader. They have no fears about Scotland becoming a rogue state and they're delighted to hear that Scotland will be returning to the European Union, to normal relations with all of its neighbours and to a full international um, role as a small country within the United Nations family, which is all anybody in the UN wants us to do. So for my money, things are looking good. The United Nations is essential here. There is also, I believe, um, a strong requirement for Scotland to have a written constitution ready uh, for when that referendum is held so that people know what the state will be. I've said this for a long time. There are multiple constitutions already written. Um, several of them have been delivered to the SNP and nothing has been done with them, but they're needed. And so is a central bank to uh, back up and issue our currency. But these things will happen. The main thing is, don't believe for a second that your referendum is illegal. It's not going to be illegal at all. It's going to be inconvenient and unpleasant for the English state because they don't want it to happen. We are effectively an exploitation colony of the greater English state. They've been plundering our oil and gas for decades. They are sucking us dry of gas at the moment because of the gas crisis. They have basically sold their natural resources and are having to buy them back. And that's why the United Kingdom is in such a mess. Scotland is a huge net exporter of gas. We should be making money from our gas, not paying more for it uh, than anywhere else in Europe. But we are. So be positive. The, the runes look good. I don't see any reason at all why the referendum should not go ahead and be fully lawful and be entirely overseen by the United Nations. Many people have been calling for this in the independence movement for years, that the best way to secede from the UK uh, and to make our own way in the European Union as a very successful exporting country is quite simply to invite the UN to adjudicate to actually watch the referendum take place to ensure that it's done correctly according to their wishes. And then nobody, even the English state, can gainsay the result.
Anyway, that's it for me today. Um, I hope that was helpful. But remember, international law is bigger than English law. It's bigger even than Scottish law. But once Scotland has refused another Section 30 request, then that is the time when we change from domestic laws to international law. And that's the time when we can gain our independence. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.